Hi all, I hope this finds you becoming a little bit more comfortable with your distance learning. Um, as always, when it comes to US history, there are plenty of opportunities beyond class time to ask questions. You can do it via message, which you guys are really, really good at, um, or we can do a quick Zoom during office hours. Now office hours for me, um, and for the most part for Obarski um, are available on the updates. I put those on the updates on Friday. So feel free to do that, you guys. Um, Zoom little mini sessions, however long they take, will clarify a whole lot and typically are not more than 10 or 15 minutes. So if you or a group of people that you know are struggling, you need clarification, you need help on concepts, then please feel free to set up a Zoom time because we can definitely do that, okay? So today's presentation um, is, of course, after we have covered reforms in class. And so we have started to see the, the, the citizens, to a certain extent, of this country identify things that they want to see changed. So in the process of that, what does the world look like? Um, what does the United States look like during those times of reform? So there's a couple different things to know. First of all, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. Um, we will ultimately get to the American Civil War and a bit of reconstruction. And so while I'm talking through presenting this information, I want you to remember that end game. Okay, so that end game um, is ultimately this explosive conflict that tears the country apart, but does not destroy it. And it changes the lives of people all over the country. So before we get to that, let's talk about what uh, the years, well, let's just say, I don't know, um, 1815 or so to 1835 or so, kind of roughly, what do those years look like in the United States? And so what I want to do is I'm going to share my screen and we are going to go through a presentation that you can find in your um, folder the folder that is entitled um, Changes and Events to the American Civil War. I think it's week 10. I believe it's week 10, but you'll see it. It'll be the last folder um, that will be revealed. So I want to start with just the, the general gist of what the country looks like. So we talked about reforms and, and all of those changes that are being made. So for those that are um, European, basically European in descent and are active part of the government of the United States, you see those reforms. If you are African, African American, your life of course looks a lot different. You are embedded in the institution of slavery. You are a victim of manipulation and abuse and torture that is bumping the economy of the South to make it a very powerful economy, primarily through the sale of cotton. If you are a native person, you are part of those, those First Nation native peoples, you are continuing to see land stolen from you as this European government, or European government is not a good way to say it, but let's just say the American government is taking that land, whether it's through violence or treaties, which ultimately end up being manipulative. So that is what this country looks like at this point in time. When we talk today, we're focusing primarily on the US um, that is made up of white people for the most part, um, and, and of course slaves and, and Native Americans, but we're gonna focus a little bit on the perspective of this American citizen. I'm trying to find a word that describes that well as respectful, but acknowledges that the uh, Europeans, those with European descent are not the only people in the United States. So let's talk about American citizens and what that American government looks like for these white American citizens. I think that works. Okay, so again, um, the years 1815 to about 1835, just roughly, um, it is called the era I have my pointer here, the era of good feelings and other things, other things we'll, we'll talk about in a second, but the era of good feelings is a time in history. And again, be careful to generalize, but 
but it, so that we will put this umbrella on everybody. But there was a feeling of success. Uh, the United States had just kind of reestablished itself against the British. And so there's this feeling of confidence. Um, people are becoming more involved as we talked about within the context of reforms. Um, people were feeling pride, pride in a country that was really starting to identify who it was, whether it was good or it was bad or whatever the case was, these, these identifying factors really, really come into play. So it's really very much about comfort and what that comfort looks like. Let's talk a little bit about nationalism. Um, Nationalism is when you feel pride for your country, pride for your country, patriotism, not a bad thing. We know that. Um, if you look at this picture that I have chosen, um, the banner says we own allegiance to no crown. So it is that acknowledgement that we do not have any, um, any need to follow the king because we have our own government. You have the American flag which is an obvious um, symbol of nationalism. You have a, an individual holding it. And then this is a, a character, I suppose, uh, called Lady Liberty. And she is crowning this um, man in this affirmation of, of freedom. And so nationalism is, is not a bad thing at all, but nationalism can be manipulated. It can be manipulated in different degrees. So, I wanna talk about one particular event that some historians would say, and, and I would agree to, to, you know, as well, that is actually an act of nationalism. So here it is. Now remember, you're writing this stuff in your notes, but you do have the advantage of being able to go back. So that's a good thing. Um, all right, so here's the event um, or the policy. It's called the Monroe Doctrine. Okay, so it is the Monroe Doctrine. 1823, so again, falls within that time frame. <clears throat> President Monroe made a declaration of sorts. It, it really had four things, but the summary of it basically is that the United States would acknowledge that there were European countries that had um, colonies still in this expanse of, of what is North America, which of course is eventually going to be the, the 48 states. So he was willing to acknowledge that and he was willing to say, okay, that's a thing that's over here. But he also makes the statement and says, however, there will not be any more additional colonization done by European countries. Okay, so no additional colonization by European countries. In fact, he went as far as to say the United States would have a response to that, a military response to that. Now, the thing about this Monroe Doctrine is it's super, super huge in US history and kind of this foreign policy. The United States has a very limited amount of, of foreign interaction at this point. We don't even talk very much about it in class, but the Monroe Doctrine is based on this idea that the United States wants to, to have control, right, power, to present the, or even represent the United States within the context of nationalism, right? So that's how it fits. So it's this idea that the United States has this right to say, you may not colonize in Western, the Western hemisphere actually, but for sure in the United States anymore, if so, we'll take action. So what I was gonna say is the United States didn't really have a, a, a military at the, that time a military response would be very delayed. So it was really just a, this declaration, but it's a very, very important piece of foreign policy. And again, the connection for some historians with national, well, most, again, like I said, for nationalism is that it's this idea that the United States and the spirit of the United States and the government of the United States is able to make a declaration and say, you're not allowed within a certain you know, boundary, geographically speaking. So it's about the United States, okay? So again, um, you know, there are good and bad things for sure that come with that, but that is, is one of the first um, actions that are, um, that is taken with that, okay? Sectionalism, 
this is important, this map, not that everything's not important, but this map really is super basic, but I, I want you to have an idea about what this concept is. So it comes from the root word section. When you, when you have a section of something, you have a piece of something. So sectionalism in US history is about how the United States started to break into different parts, okay, or different sections. So what we started to see was that that was increasingly more and more of a problem because each section had their own ideas about what was appropriate for their people, for their economy, for their goals. And so we start to see the country break down to a certain extent. Now, if you go to the spoiler alert that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation, take that idea of sectionalism and the country starting to break down into its own interests via these sections. And it's really, really a thing, you guys, when we talk about the North and the South. So sectionalism is gonna play, play a, a huge role in the American Civil War. All right, so let's talk about how that actually happens. It happens through something called, an example of, of, of how sectionalism really starts to break down the country is the tariff of abominations. Now, this is economic, so I'm gonna get as basic as possible. There are actually two tariffs. Um, the first one is in the year 1828. Okay, so the first one is in the year 1828. Now, the goal of a tariff is it's a tax, so tariff and tax, it's a tax on imports or things that are brought into the country to sell. So England may import uh, or export, and you, you, uh, the U.S., let me start over, the U.S. may import cloth from England, so they will buy it from England. So there's going to be a relationship with countries, right? Trade relationships where you purchase certain things from a country and you sell certain things to a country. So the tariff of abominations in um, 28, 1828 is going to create a tariff and it's going to create a almost 50% increase in the price of, let's just say, those textiles that we are purchasing from England. So here's the bottom line. If you have a factory in Massachusetts that is making cloth and you have England sending in cloth and textiles, so these are both textiles, and the price is the same, except you have to add more money because you have to cover the tariff, right? What are you going to buy? So we call that protectionist. So the idea is that because what is made in the United States is cheaper, that protects those manufacturers. So let me say it again. So you have, let me use my, my hands here. You have two pieces of cloth. One is made in Massachusetts. One is purchased from England and brought into the country. The tariff or the tax on the import is 50% added. So if each one of these is a dollar, you're adding a 50% tax. So now the Massachusetts textile is a dollar, but the, the textile coming in from England is a dollar 50 because of that import. What are you going to pay, right? You're going to protect. Okay. So for the North, amazing, right? Because now when you put that money on, England's going to say, eh, we're not going to sell it to you guys because it's going to cost us more. It's not worth it. And so the manufacturing in Massachusetts is going to say, sweet, the, there's no foreign competition. We can sell it at a good price. It's that concept of buying American. That's what I always think. It's buying American and it's to protect those US manufacturers um, or US farmers or industrialists or whatever it is, but it's this idea of protecting the economics of the United States. Now, that sounds great. Uh, it is great. I mean, it, it, it brings money in, right? For the North, but for the South, the problem is, is that if there is no relationship and if there's no money coming into the English, Okay, right. So we're not buying English products anymore. We're buying US products. 
then typically the economic consequence for the English is going to be they're going to have less money. If they have less money, they're not going to want to buy things like cotton from the United States. So the Southerners are saying, hold on a second, this is not okay. It's great for you in the North, fantastic, wonderful, but it's creating issues for other countries. And my example was England, but it could be other countries buying our cotton. So it's unfair, right? So it's unfair. So especially South Carolina is gonna get pretty vocal about it. So they're gonna say, you know what? This is not something that is good for our economy. Sorry, guys, I'm gonna move around a little bit. My chair is loud. So the Southerners are gonna, or South Carolina is gonna say, this is not good for our economy. And because it's not good for our economy, we're gonna blow it off, okay? Um, we are not gonna pay that tax. We, I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't work for us. We're, we're not gonna be, you know, a part of it. So step in that idea of sectionalism, right? So it's good for the North, but it's not so good for the South. The North is going to have the only product that the country is going to buy, but the South, that depends on a relationship in large part with other countries is going to start losing money. So here's the, here's the million dollar question. Okay, here's the million, do million dollar question. So if that is true, then how, are we gonna, how is this gonna be resolved? Okay. So this is during the presidency of Jackson. And so he's going to have to grapple with this question about South Carolina, who is being very, very difficult, and how it's going to be resolved. Because what's happened is there's an S word that starts to sneak in to this frustration, this, this tariff of, of abominations, and it's called secession. Okay, so it's called secession. I think it's S-E-C-C-I-S. I-O-N, if you guys know me, I'm a horrible speller on the fly, okay, but the word secession. Secession essentially means this concept of separation, okay, sectionalism, it all starts with an S. So the difference between sectionalism and separation is that as a result of this refusal to follow the laws that are connected with the tariff of abominations, in 1828, South Carolina says, fine, we're out. We're separating, we're seceding from the union. We are nullifying or getting rid of or eliminating our participation in the tariff, this tariff and all of the things that go with it. And if you don't respect that, we're out, we, we are seceding. Now that's gonna be a word that by the end of the week, you're gonna be even more familiar with, but you need to understand exactly what that looks like. Now, what's gonna happen is President Jackson is gonna to have to, to work through this and there's gonna be members of Congress that are, they have to, to mull through this. And ultimately what they decide is no, it's not okay. We are going to do something about it. We've got to do something about it. And hence what happens is something called the force bill. Okay, so the force bill. And President Jackson says, you either comply with the tariff of abominations and all the things that go with that, right? Or we are gonna take military action so that you can't secede from the union. Ultimately, what happens is South Carolina breaks down. There is an attempt um, in 1832 to drop that tariff. It doesn't do a whole lot. When I say drop that tariff, I mean, I should clarify, down from 50%. I think it might go down to 40% or something. But of course, it doesn't make a huge difference for the South Carolinians. But Andrew Jackson, President Jackson, brings in troops that, or, or threatens, I should say, uh, to bring in troops to resolve the situation if it, it doesn't get resolved on its own. Now, people in the United States are saying that is a win for nationalism, right? That is a win. It's the federal government taking control when the federal government needs to. And so we go back to nationalism and we say, all right, 
you know, this is something our country needs to do together. We need to stay together. And the fact that we have a president and a Congress that are willing to, to make that happen is a positive thing. Now, that's going to last for not very long, to be honest, okay? But it, it's, it's a step in the direction of the concept of secession, um, that separation based on what was good for South Carolina and then ultimately um, the South. All right, let me just look and make sure that I have what I want for so far. Okay, so the last thing, I think it's the last thing in this presentation that we need to um, understand is something that I have entitled the balance of power. Um, we as a country are dividing into lots of different categories. Um, and you can see right here by the key that this is in the year 1846. So we've moved out of that era of good feelings um, in large part because of this nullification, right? This, this elimination, this attempt at, at elimination by South Carolina to secede based on this tariff of abomination. So we have this dynamic that's changing. And so we start to see this, this end of this era of good feelings. So here's the situation as we see it in the country about 1846. So you have slave states in pink. You have blue states that are free states. So non-slave states, okay? You have slave territories now understand the difference. You're going to watch a video and we'll talk via on uh, probably Thursday. I don't know. We'll see what, if we do this Thursday in class, but you're going to have a video that's going to talk about territories. Here's the thing. When you look at this map and you see balance of power, and obviously these are the free states. These are the, or excuse me, these are the slave states. These are the free states. You probably knew that coming in. What complicates things are territories and they are quickly quickly being added to the United States and then broken into states have to make a decision about whether or not their state is going to be a slave state or a free state. Now, that's one of the issues, right? The next is that politicians, Congress, the president in a variety of different administrations during the middle 1800s, early to middle 1800s, are going to say balance of power. We want to make sure that there is as many free states as there are slave states because the influence in fairness to each of those those sections, right, um, interest needs to be represented. So these are the challenges, all of these unorganized territories. Now, there's been a breakdown. The blue tends to be this different color blue, if you can see my cursor, um, is more about free territories. And you have um, this, this section, Southwest section of the United States that's really kind of, of there's, there's a couple dynamics, which we're gonna talk about quickly in a second here, but they're also are going to have to address the issue of slavery. So this idea of balance of power is pre-Civil War, obviously. And the idea is how do we keep a balance of free states and slave states and make sure that those interests of free states and slave states are equally represented? So that is what I mean by the balance of power. The Alamo and the Mexican War, as we move into the 1840s as well, as we move past even this map of 1846, we're going to have a series of events that are gonna happen in the Southwest part of what will eventually of course be the United States. And so I chose this map um, to just give you a sense of what was happening. Now, I'm gonna do this super fast. There are two, three actually uh, videos in the folder that talk about the Alamo and the Mexican American War. You're going to need to watch those. You might want to watch them a couple times, but here is the bottom line. This geographically is a part of what will ultimately be the United States that has a couple challenges. Of course, slavery is one of them, but it's kind of a weird challenge because this is land with the exception of Texas. This is land that actually belongs to Mexico. 
And so here's the deal. What do we do with this land, right? So what happens with this land? There's going to be a war, and I, I apologize, we have to oversimplify this a little bit, but there's going to be a war. There's going to be a conflict that is going to occur between the United States and Mexico. It's going to be over a variety of different things. It's going to be primarily over land, which is what war is about, right? It's about land and the right to control and govern land. And so that's a big part of it. It's about boundaries. Okay, so for Texas, once it becomes a state, what's the boundary for Texas going to be? The big controversy is this Rio Grande. Okay, so this big river. The other is going to be slavery. That tends to be a little bit more early on. That's a piece of the puzzle, um, like we talked about, whoops, sorry, like we talked about here on this map. Okay, but this is going to be an even, even bigger issue of land. So if, if I'm breaking this down in its, its most, you know, like small piece of information, um, this is what the country is ultimately going to look like after the Mexican-American War. Because as you know, the United States is going to successfully um, conquer the land. That's going to be a goal. Remember, expansion and, and that idea of manifest destiny um, is going to eventually conquer this land that is fought over in the War of 18, or excuse me, the Me Mexican-American War in 1846. It's only two years, but it, it establishes a, a lot. So again, in your folder, you're going to watch a video about the Alamo, which is a very historical, symbolic um, idea of fighting for freedom. Now, the Mexican government would, you know, and Mexican people in some cases would very much disagree with that. But for US history, that is a, an event um, of honor and an event of fighting for what you believe in and sacrifice. The Mexican-American War you know, comes later and that is about land and control of the land and this acquisition of land via the concept of manifest destiny, which we talked about before. So I want to emphasize you guys that there are maps on here and I'm not a big map person at, like color in the, the stuff with map, with maps and countries and all of that but I am a map person within the context of understanding the bigger picture. So if you understand these two maps, while yes, you need more detail, you understand that in 1830, the United States didn't really have control of or an, a structure for the Oregon um, territory. And it was also um, land that was held by Mexico. 25 years later, the United States government controls what we now call the lower 48. So if you can understand that there's a difference and that there's a war that took that, that's a small part of, of how you can understand this information. Um, I think that that is it. Please make sure that you watch those videos because that's going to put together, especially this part um, about the Alamo and the Mexican-American War. And it's really, really important because it fits into this, these changes, um, these other things that happened in the United States that are, are going to ultimately cause tension. And ultimately there's aspects of this expansion that are going to drive the United States to civil war. All right, I think that that is it for me. Um, please make sure that you ask questions as needed, clarifications. Um, this is new to me as well. Lecturing to a recording or recording a lecture is odd because typically you make changes and people have different questions and different classes. So if I have not been clear, please ask the question because it's not out of the out of this world that your question is a question that everyone is asking and I need to make some clarifications. So that being said, I want you guys to have a great um, a great week and we will see you on Thursday. Um, and I'm excited about that to see you on a more regular basis. So we will um, talk to you soon.